And there came a day. A day unlike... Wait. No, that's been done. Hmm. Who knows what evil lurks and... No, that is that other thing. What has yellow skin and rights? Ah, oh, forget it. You're listening to Panelology. Excelsi, oh, damn it. Welcome to episode 222 of Panelology. I'm Alex. And I'm Brian. 222, two, two, huh? 222. Two, two. All right. We are, we are at a number that is repetitive. That's right. 11 times 11, right? No. No. <laughs> I wanted to see if you would fall for it. You immediately went down. I was like, damn, he's not going to go for it. <laughs> You are off by one family of Dalmatians. <laughs> there we go. I love it. Yeah. That's a standard uh, unit of measure, right? A, a one one family of Dalmatians? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, excellent. It's 101 yeah. for those of you who are confused by that, and I'm yes. not explaining it further. <laughs> How was your week this week, Brian? Uh, It was pretty good until Friday-ish, yeah. But, until uh, that pesky weekend showed up. You know, right, yeah. Well, if you keep working on Saturday and then have to get up Sunday morning and do stuff, is it still considered weekend? No. I mean, there's people who have to work every weekend, so I get that, you know, so <laughs> whatever. I, You know what? I don't even know. I'm rambling, and that's kind of how it's going to be. <laughs> Wait, you ramble? No, oh, never. Hey, easy, easy. <laughs> Sorry. I, I. That's my one for this episode. We don't bully Brian's. <laughs> I mean, we do, but... <laughs> Well, I had every intention yesterday of baking chocolate babka because, like, a year ago, I picked up one at Publix, and no one in this city carries it, and Publix does not regularly stock it anymore. Okay. Um. So I had resigned to making my own, which is like a whole day slash overnight process. I did not start that yesterday. I thought about the amount of effort that would take and thought, no, not this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it just be like that. Yeah. I think what I'll do is, I've got a couple of quiet nights this week. I'll make, like, the filling one night, and the, the crumble one night, and then make the actual breaded part next weekend, and just put it all together. Break it out over the course of the week. That is the much plan. Much more reasonable. Yeah. Well, that is a uh, rife vein of conversation, so moving right along. <laughs> there we go. Cutting out that shockingly long silence uh first order of business this week we are spotlighting an original graphic novel by friend of the show jeremy whitley and artist jamie noguchi school for extraterrestrial girls volume one girl on fire this is out this week we have done i have done i will take the blame for this one a bad job of getting this to everyone quickly enough to actually read it and talk about it um, uh, but uh, I have yep. read most. Yeah, I was going to say my my intent was either last night or or this morning, both of which were you know the aforementioned work that I was not planning on doing. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. um, we're not going to talk about how long I've actually had this. Okay. <laughs> uh, instead, we're going to talk about it, or at least I will. Yeah. Um, this is about a young girl named Tara who basically wants to live a very mundane version of an exceptional life. Best in school, top of her class, get a good job, all those sorts of things. Um, very relatable to Young Ages Alex. Uh, this is a Young Ages book. And then one day learns that she is, in fact, actually maybe capable of spontaneous human combustion when she catches okay. on fire in her classroom. And uh, might actually be, as you as you would guess from the title, School for Extraterrestrial Girls, an alien uh, who has to enroll in a School for Extraterrestrial Girls to learn about her alien race and its history and abilities and 
all of that knowledge that she does not possess, uh, as well as the usual, you know, math, science, social studies, English. Hopefully there's some art classes in there somewhere, because that's important. Um, and that is that is the premise. We're not going to get deep into it or spoil anything here, because, well, it isn't out yet. Uh, but it is available on August 4th, which I believe is Tuesday. If you're listening to this this week, you can get it from wherever you might normally get it. Uh, bookstores, comic shops, etc. Uh, yeah. But it is fun. The art is good. Uh, it is, I think, a, a, a good pick for young ages uh, comic readers. Excellent. Yeah. Moving on to... Weekly issues of comics. We are doubling up on this week's and last week's books uh, since we did the Umbrella Academy episode last week. And we're going to start with Batman 95. Brian. Not a surprise. Yeah, so um, Joker War is here. Um, we, this, is, uh, this is part one. And um, it did not... I was a little shocked when I got into this, and I will tell you very bluntly: the uh, the the very first word on the very first page is a little, uh, you know, one of those lovely little artist editor box things that says "years ago," which I missed. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, don't that whatever. Just my brain just decided it didn't want to recognize that that was there. Um, Not so in media res. Right, so so when I turn the page and Alfred is sitting there at the console, and I'm like, okay, I have missed something. <laughs> <laughs> that something <Yeah. laughs> was the editorial box the, that said years ago. Yeah, so um, you know, there's there's that little caption. Um, <laughs> but um, essentially, yeah, this is um uh, Batman trying to get a grip of on what it is Joker really has planned now um and essentially it's Joker and Punchline taking over the city and starting to exert their influence yeah um we actually get very little of Batman in the present timeline of this not a ton yeah which I think is a good choice. It gives us a chance to see sort of what the Joker is up to, what has happened to the city and Wayne Tech after, uh, if you're not caught up, spoilers, I guess, for the basic premise of this thing. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it was definitely yeah. the part before in the setup, yeah. yeah. Um, the Joker has seized all of Bruce Wayne's fortunes and Wayne Tech and now runs everything bruce wayne did uh and bruce wayne has not exactly been outed as batman in the process but like all of batman's gadgets have been seized as wayne tech right yeah, yeah it's like, there's a bit of a combination of like the green arrow thing where you know he has lost his company to somebody else that that's not good and a bit of the Tony Stark thing where, you know, it's like, oh, no, all of these assets belong to us that you were using yeah. for superhero stuff. Right, yeah. So there's some vibes, of, there's some threads of that in here. Yeah. Um, The thing that is remarkable to me about mm -hmm. what Tynan is doing here is as tired as I am of Joker stories yeah. and as tired as I am of somebody takes over Bruce Wayne's life and takes over Gotham stories. Like, we had City of Bane. Right. Um, there were elements that were similar. Not the same, but similar yeah. in Snyder's run. Like, as much as these kinds of stories play over and over, I'm still really enjoying this. And I think Tynan knows that this is something that plays over and over because Joker yeah. has a line in this. Yeah. That is to the effect of people want the familiar, people want to see the same stories over and over, but they want a story that strips it down and shows you something new beneath. Yeah. And that line kind of feels like a thesis for what's happening here. It, it does. He, it, it's, he knows what he's getting into doing this story again. Yeah. And therefore, I have confidence that it's not going to be exactly what we expect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that being said, we haven't really talked about this. What's your take on Punchline? Uh, what do you mean? 
like it, it, do you like the character? Are you glad that this character's here? I so far I do. Um mm-hmm. I like that so here and and I think the reasons I like punchline maybe are more mechanical than anything cuz mm-hmm. yeah. Other than that one story in the Joker 80th anniversary issue that's kind of her proving herself to the Joker and the fight with Harley and Catwoman, we haven't actually seen a whole lot of her. Not a lot, no. Um, But I like her for a couple of reasons. One, it gives us someone who can take the uh, uh, lieutenant to the Joker role Mm -hmm. without having to constantly yo-yo Harley into that role. Yeah. I I have... If I've complained about anything consistently on this podcast, it is the way Harley gets yanked back and forth and back and forth. And now that Punchline is here, like, it does actually feel like that need to tell the story by pulling Harley back in is maybe broken some. Yep. I also like that it's a different flavor of Lieutenant. It's not... It's not someone who is, hey, look at me, I'm wacky. It's, she's very serious. She's very she, focused she is, and precise. Uh, one might say deadly serious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's, it, it, there's it, a it, precision to her that feels different than the Joker's usual shtick, but makes sense in a big plan like this. Right. As, as being, the Joker is not, a precise tool. The Joker is a big blunt instrument because that's scarier. But having someone who can be a needle in the eye, metaphorically, <laughs> is scary in its own right. Yeah, and I think that's what I, I was very hesitant about this character at first just because of the obvious, you know, initial surface similarities to Harley, right? Yeah. Um, but I, the more I see of this character and the more I realize what she's doing, uh, the more I like her. And that yeah. is w- exactly what you said. One, she has now completely freed Harley of that Harley Joker relationship that has to, you know, somehow had to keep happening. Right. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that she is very different personality wise than Harley, like almost right. 180. Right. But yet still has that, on, like I said, on the surface, if you just looked at him, you go, oh, great, they're giving us another Harley, right? Yeah. Yeah, not I... at all. And then finally, I think the fact that she is, exactly like you said, so precise and, and ordered and meticulous and that kind of thing offsets Joker in a way that's very different from anybody we have seen him with. Yeah, like... You see it with Batman in this issue. He is thinking, yeah. how do I fight the Joker? Right. And, like, Punchline's move in this is very much a Scarecrow kind of move. It's definitely oh, something yeah. Batman could have planned for, but because her presence requires him to adjust his thinking about fighting in the Joker in a way he's not yet accustomed to, because I think this is the first time they actually face off against each other. I think so. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't have that strategy yet. It keeps him guessing because which one of them are you going to get? How are you going to plan for that? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I like the Joker's a blunt instrument. The Joker's more like a bomb that has no timer and could just randomly go off. <laughs> I mean, that's that's blunt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, fair enough, but like an yeah. atomic bomb is an atomic bomb <laughs> is a blunt instrument. <laughs> an atomic bomb. Wow. I don't know why, but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna cut it out, but I guess now it has to stay. <laughs> yes, the immortal herc uh, of the atomic the, bomb. <laughs> Perfect. Um yeah, so it, it, essentially uh, Batman is declared a villain, you know, uh Bruce Wayne is wanted for questioning. Because of uh, embezzlement charges. Lucius Fox is acupunctured with uh, Joker toxin that make him cooperate. Yep. And the last scene that we get is, you know, one of, uh, as an example, Joker now has all of Batman's toys. So he has a bat wing that comes up to a building and fires, you know, explosive rockets into the building to kill Batman. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, specifically the next title the next issue is titled all these wonderful toys yes yeah yeah all so, right moving on should be fun yeah yep deceased hope at world's end number six man i really like these books <laughs> i do too I don't know if we said that or not but um yeah this is the one that you had mentioned to me we had talked about you know uh, with suicide squad right and I mentioned that, you know, one of the characters I really liked was Wayne. And you were like, oh, then you definitely have to get caught up on yeah. Hope at World's End. And yeah, the, I I love them in this book. Yeah, they um, are fantastic. I like that they are, you know what they feel like? They feel like what Marvel teen heroes kind of used to feel like. Yeah, well, I think. There's another Tom Taylor book we're going to talk about this week. We're going to say yeah. something very similar. Yeah. You you yes. But do you, you know what I mean by that where they're kind of outside the system and you know her her costume is clearly a t-shirt with a W that that's a take on yeah. the anarchy sign, right? Yeah, like it's a very <laughs> It's a very Into the Spider-Verse Miles Morales kind of take, if you want a, a contemporary version. Like, yeah. where he's wearing a hoodie and some running shorts and... Right. And, like, they're they're just trying to do good. Yeah. Right? And, you know, that doesn't necessarily always follow the rules, and so, therefore, you know, they can get in trouble. Right. Like, And that's a yeah. little easier, I think, to pull off when you don't have... Massive government organizations like S.H.I.E.L.D. trying to police and register superheroes or yep. the U.S. Congress voting to outlaw teenage superheroes, things like that. <laughs> uh, the other thing, and this, uh, to to be, you know, fair to Marvel is very much so, and I think it's why it works with teen heroes so well, is the longer they exist and the more is known about them and the more stories and the more history they have, the harder it is to do that and feel that way. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the one moment in time problem, right? It's why yeah. do some people at Marvel feel like Spider-Man can't get married and be an adult? Why undo his marriage? Right. Well, you've got, at that point, what, 40 years of history. Yeah. He he feels like he's matured. An audience has grown up with him. It's it's hard, I think, to balance that, which is why I think new characters like these are so important. Yeah. Um, well, you, and can't, I, you know... You can't leave characters frozen at the same status quo for 40 years. Right. It, 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 and it goes right back to that same conversation we just had about Punchline, about how introducing new characters gives you something different to play off of right yeah yep it also lets you tell wholly new stories yeah oh so good i i, I love this whole this and like like we mentioned before i'm not a huge zombie guy like i enjoy no, zombie neither. stories but like it's not like my thing right yeah but this the, just the stories in this and it's the it's 100 percent tom taylor telling characters yeah. and that's what i love about it well, you know, it's funny. We've both said that we're not zombie people. You know who also admitted recently to not being a zombie person? Who? Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor. <laughs> well, there you go. Maybe it's Which, because maybe it's because he's not telling a zombie story. He's telling a story in a zombie setting. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Tom Taylor characters who feel like teenage Marvel superheroes. Suicide Squad number seven. <laughs> um, the obvious segue there is Wink and Airy, but maybe there is another. Oh, did you have the same thought I had like as soon as she showed up in that cosplay? When did Kate Bishop and Gabby Kinney have a child together? <laughs> I did not have that that thought. But it will never now leave my head because yes, one hundred percent. Apparently, um, apparently they ha they made a clone of Laura Ken or it could be Gabby, but obviously you know Laura, whoever. Uh, uh, yeah, there is a clone that has mixed their DNA, much like the old Superboy with Lex Luthor and Superman. Yeah, and this this is the result. Who knew? Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor knew. 
Tom Taylor knew. Um, so no. Deadshot goes home. Yep, and, and we, uh, we we I think his daughter. Uh, I'm I'm a little sketchy on all of the Suicide Squad history, especially in the last you know fifteen years or so. Yeah, I think we've seen her in comics before. Like I'm, I'm I sure know she's have. shown up for you know panels or so. I don't know yeah. how much she has. We've ever had stories that involved her. Yeah, I feel like certainly like, for the the stories I have read, mm-hmm. um, which is a little bit of Suicide Squad, like a Deadshot issue, she's more like the carrot dangling in front of him. Yeah, than she's used a for character. his motivation. Yes. Yeah, that's all she's been used for, really. Um, she's a glorified lamp. Yes, exactly. Um, not so in this story. No, not at no. all. No. Not not at all. So, th- this starts out, we talked about how last issue Deadshot, you know, found out that he he has actually served his time, more than served his time, and has actually gotten his pardon. Yes. So, he's like, all right, that's it then. I'm out. I'm going to do what I always said, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to get my daughter, and, you know, I'm going to quit this life. I don't know what I'm going to do, but, you know, I'm not doing this anymore because I don't want her involved in this. Right? Yeah. And he gets home and knocks on the door, and she comes and opens it, and he's, like, super worried. He's like, I know you probably don't want me here. And, and she just gives him the big full-on tackle hug. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's so good. The um, dog's tail is wagging. Yes. And and remember the dog, because that we're going to mention the dog again in just a minute. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she's, like, super happy to see him. And I love her mix of... Knowing who he is and not approving of what he does, but understanding that she's his dad and she's always going to love him anyway, and that, you know, the choices and what he has done does not mean that he is, like, an irredeemable, horrible person to yeah. her, right? Um, And <laughs> so he goes into her room, and she comes out in this very, very... I, I'm Homemade trying to think of the found item kind of costume. Yeah, very like first cosplay co- type yeah. costume, right? Um, and calls herself Live Shot instead of obviously Dead Shot. Yeah. And she's been practicing her archery, and um, like it is the like the purple Kate Bishop type sunglasses. Uh huh. And you know, uh, a, a little like short cape, like an old style like Robin short cape. Yep. It cracks me up. A capelet. Right? Yeah, and, and he's like, okay, you cannot let your mom see this. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, because um, his mom is like on the fence. She's like, are you really trying to change this, that, and the other? Well, of course, Ted Cord is now, I guess, truly awful. And, yep. <laughs> you know, basically has them put out wanted things for all of the... Suicide Squad. So, like, super big manhunt now going on. And, of course, his ex-wife sees it and says, you haven't changed. You know, the whole, whole big dis- standard misunderstanding there. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Um, and essentially the FBI shows up to arrest yep. him. He immediately surrenders because he doesn't want to put Zoe at risk. Correct. They instead react by escalating and being brutal toward him. Yes. Like yeah, there's a lot. I think there's a there. I think that was a big social commentary moment. There. Yeah. Um, and so like yeah, literally he is putting up with all of it. Right. They've got him on the ground. He's he literally he says, "Eat the fucking dirt. I'll do it for her." Right. Yeah. Like they've got his face down in the ground, and then you just see this arrow go into the knee of a uh, FBI agent. He used to be an she... adventurer like you until <laughs> until. Um, and you flip the page, and I love this page of her. It's so um, good. There, it is literally a shot up the steps of the front porch. She is standing on the steps, like, you know, one foot, two steps down, one step on the porch. She's got her bow with an arrow pulled back. She's got her, you know, glasses on, the capelet, everything. Just looks awesome. And the dog is standing next to her with a cape. And so, and sunglass vis- visor sunglasses on, 
to look mm-hmm. like the sidekick. And oh my god, it is the most amazing thing. <laughs> it's so, so good. It's so good. And of course, he is, his reaction is like, no! And the FBI immediately, you know, put guns on her and are saying that, you know, if she doesn't drop it, they're, they're going to shoot, right? Um, and so then Lawton reacts. He's yeah. like, yeah, he what he can't take is her being threatened, right? Yeah. He starts disarming so, and incapacitating, but not killing. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. He, he, yeah. It's shin shots and knee shots and shoulder shots. And yeah. Um, yeah. And then an FBI agent fires on her, on his daughter. And wink to the not, rescue. And then, yeah. And then wink comes in and teleports her out of the way. Right. Are His you my father's awesome. friends? Well, I don't think he knows he has friends. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> but he does. Yeah, so Suicide Squad followed him to, like, when they found out that that they were all now wanted and that he was among them, they, like, came after him to make sure he was okay. Yep. And that was just awesome, by the way. So um, good. Yeah. <laughs> Like, the whole Suicide Squad shows up, right? And they're talking to him. She's like, hmm. uh, We can make this easy for you, or we can do it the painful way. Now run. And they all take off. (laughs) It's beautiful. 2020 has brought us a lot of strange things. But Suicide Squad being possibly my favorite DC book is among the strangest. This is this is super I I would 100% agree this is super odd. Like I almost didn't start this this uh in new cycle of it. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? I I really I and I usually I'll be on. I usually really enjoy that first six arc of almost any book just because of how new it is, right? Yeah. There's always a lot of energy in the book at that point. Um this has been phenomenal. Um but I go back to, did you have the thought that I had when this happened? Knowing what's coming up, and I think we've already talked about it because it's been in the news all over the place. Yeah. Do you think Zoe is going to take his place with the revolutionaries? Uh, is that the I question? Think, uh, I, yeah, it is. And I don't know that it's going to happen immediately, and I don't know that it will be with the revolutionaries. But I do think 100% Live Shot at some point will be a character. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I will not leave you on the hook the way I did uh, recently on making you guess things, but Tom Taylor has been teasing a new project all week, which started out looking like an injustice teaser. He's been spelling out a letter every day. The last three days spelled out JSA. Uh, oh. The rumor, the word on the street is that it might be an injustice year zero book about the JSA in the injustice universe. Oh, wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have not seen a lot of like the JSA, the Golden Age folks yeah. there. But with that said, imagine him on an incontinuity JSA book. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Next. Okay. Next. Wonder Woman number seven fifty nine. <sighs> the beginning of Mariko Tamaki and Mikel Yanin's run. So, um. What was your favorite part of this? Uh, it was one specific panel, or maybe a pair of panels if you want the setup, um, in which Wonder Woman has rescued a bunny, and its owner pops in, and Wonder Woman says, oh, we were just talking. The bunny's owner says, you're a bad bunny, and Wonder Woman replies, he does have a foul mouth. Yep. That was my favorite part. This is an ordinary bunny, by the way. This is not a talking rabbit. Nope. This is nope. a regular old white bunny. It's Mulaney. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm going to say my favorite part of this book was the art. Oh, well, yes. I mean, And that is, that is not a knock on the story in any way, because I absolutely loved the story. No, but it's, Mikhail Yanin it's a com- is a tight. It's a comment on how good the art is in this. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, we get, we, it, it, this is kind of fun because we get like a three page kind of setup slash recap of, you know, who Wonder Woman is, right? Yeah. And like anybody needs that, but it's, 
Well, and it's it's done in a way, though, that sets up what is very clearly the theme of this run, or at least the yep. beginning of this run, which right. is everybody thinks they're in the right. We look at heroes as people who are in the right, but what if they're like anyone else and not always in the right? Yeah. Who's the uh, hero uh, then? Yeah, and, and there's there's things that are slipped in that are, are the reason that they do this recap thing. Comments like, imagine, because it's talking about how she fought the God of War, imagine a battle against the God of War being just one of many, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, it's reminding us that, yes, she has done what are, like, insanely, ridiculously amazing things, right? But then, kind of at the end of it, but they are still people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and and that leads um by the way immediately into that scene that you were talking about where she talks she finds the bunny and the girl that's her new neighbor it, uh you know comes over to find the bunny and she talks to her and so like it leads into this very very everyday scene yeah right with this this very very everyday scene which is about oh my old place had a lot more ledges I need to go to I think it's called Fern. Fern, the, yeah. The knockoff Ikea. Yeah. Um, I need to go to Fern to... Because it's got an umlaut. It does. Uh, I need to go to Fern to get something to set all of these vases and swords and whatnot on. I love the one crate that's just marked Clark and Bruce. I know. I saw that, too. I'm like, what? Uh, you know what? I best i don't know what's and in I love this one i just... probably should mark it with something other than do not open the other thing that i love is is so you know some people would hire a moving company in this and there who does wonder woman have moving all of these boxes and like all of her furniture and all this stuff in you just see this row of like five amazon <laughs> <carrying> <laughs> this stuff in. it's beautiful and clearly emma who is the girl from next door yeah. who owns the bunnies um is gonna be a character in this next arc and i, I think am, that's yeah i'm, I'm totally a big fan of this. this character already me too me too um we do learn that she was in a car wreck and it has given her some issues with her memory yeah like it sounds like short term yeah short term memory problems Correct. she writes notes to herself on her hands is yeah. is what diana notices right away yeah um, super, super cool. And then we get into what is going to be the probably, you know, the more traditional part of the story, um, which is there's a mother who just is in, her and her husband are at Fjern and before he can get in the car with the daughter, the mother just takes off in the car and yeah. is like literally driving at, you know, hundred miles an hour down the freeway you know, on the wrong side of it, this whole thing. Wonder Woman stops the car, and we see her eyes glowing in this with a purple-pink glow, um, which is very reminiscent if you know the history of the character we're going to find soon. Mm-hmm. And um, so Wonder Woman stops it, and she's like, I don't remember doing that. I just thought I was driving home. Uh, and then we see Wonder Woman breaking into this prison, which is um, had essentially like a breakout, a riot inside, right? And she's going in to take it down. And uh, she gets there. All the prisoners stop fighting her and kill themselves. And she looks up. And who do we find? Maxwell Lord. Max Lord. Oh. One might say, well, lordy me. Um... <laughs> Also known as that dude Wonder Woman killed that one time. Yeah, yeah. Oof, a lot of a lot of big emotion in 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 this beat up. Yeah, yeah. I Which, really enjoyed this. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. If you, and if you're gonna talk about a Wonder Woman story where you ask, are heroes always right? You know, the one where Wonder Woman killed Max Lord is certainly <laughs> you know amongst yeah. those questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't. I cannot wait for this. Like I said, I am. I am in love with the artwork in this. There may only be one book this week that I will drool about the art in more, and we'll get to that at some point. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Okay. But uh, yeah, 
Uh, oh my god, I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Can't wait for more. Cool. Moving on, let's check in with everything Empire over at Marvel. Yeah, that was quite a few books this week. Yes, I have yeah. these basically broken out in reading order. Okay. So, Lords of Empire, Emperor Hulkling. This is this is actually exactly what I expected it would be, which is a recap of kind of Teddy's history. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, how who he is, how he got to where he is, and now kind of an introduction to who what he may try to be in this position. Yeah, I think I think for me the highlights in this are obviously the relationship with Wiccan. Yep. Um, but also we get a little bit of information here that I don't think we had entirely until maybe the end of Empire number three. So for a couple of weeks, this was on, this was our only hint that Tanleth was up to something explicitly mm-hmm. up to something behind the scenes uh we also know that teddy and wiccan are only pretending to be separated so uh there yeah there's a point where basically they say if you're going to be our emperor you have to renounce all things and all ties to earth yes right? and specifically the biggest part of that that they mean is he has to break off his relationship with wiccan his yeah. engagement right um and clearly we know why he has taken this role at all and you know it's to save literally you know potentially billions of lives right and in order to do that he renounces his relationship to all things earth and renounces his engagement uh to wiccan and i was there was about half a page where i was super scared that i was like are they really going to do this right? yeah um and you know, Wiccan's like, I understand. You know, I, I I hate that this has to happen, but I get why you feel it's necessary, and you know the whole thing. And then you know, we're like two pages later, a page later, I don't remember exactly pacing, but uh, you know, everybody like then leaves Teddy alone in the throne room, and Wiccan teleports back in, and he's like, Yeah, I know we're good. I know you just did that because you had to in front of everyone. Da da da. da. And it's like, okay. This I buy. Like, thank God you actually had <laughs> characters that were mature enough to, you know, to understand there's a difference between what somebody says and what they mean and what's really going on. Right. Uh, then we move on to Empire number two, and I think, I think we can talk probably more about two than about three. Um, yeah. But we can talk a little bit about them both together. We we see we see how everyone gets out of the Kotati attack. Um, Carol is made a Kree accuser. Specifically is presented and, and given, uh, Ronan's hammer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, after, after channeling Teddy's magical sword to repel the attack. Yes. Using her energy absorption powers. Uh, we also see, and three is where... Empire number three is where the cracks from the delays because of Diamond ceasing shipping and yeah. Marvel's having to cut some books yeah. begin to show a little bit. Uh, we see Tony in his lab kind of manically working because he is upset about having bought into Koi's plan. Yes. Uh, and like, this scene with with Tony and Reed is is I think one of the most important bits of these two issues. I, um, I would I would agree. I think this is gonna that's gonna be a pivotal yeah. thing. Yeah. And why I see this is where we start to see some of the cracks. We get the the Captain America one shot. Uh we got that this week. But the Thor one shot, or maybe maybe it was two or three issues even that was supposed to happen has been canceled. The Spider-Man tie-ins have been canceled. Uh, if you look right. at the end of this week's Empire books, there is a revised list that is about half the size of the original. Yeah. Um, and, like, the Thor example here is we're told Thor is off looking for something in space, and, like, we never got that tie-in, so we don't know what exactly is, right? what's up with him. And I'm sure they're gonna. Th- there'll be a couple of pages when he comes back with whatever it was that yeah. you know, 
tell us about it. But yeah, that was supposed to be, I think, like a two issue or three issue. Yeah. You know, time. It was series. also, I think, Rom V, which bums me out because we all yeah. know how I feel about Rom V's writing. Um, Fair enough. Uh, the other thing we get here, uh, I think this is the. There's a big reveal at the end of Empire 3 that I don't want to spoil here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do also want to mention Mantis shows up. Yes. Um, and Mantis is. Mantis, I think, is going to act as, or at least kind of immediately acts as, an alternative to Black Panther is planning to win a war by fighting. And her response is, well, okay, but he's my son. I'm going to save him. Talking about yes. Koi. Yep. Um, so I like the energy she brings into this. Well, and I like the fact that, you know, one of the big uh, supporters, motivators, um, encouragers for Koi is, you know, his father, Swordsman, yeah. right? And now we have a direct foil to that in Mantis on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Like, one of the things I think this series is doing so well, and we're halfway through at this point, these issues seem to be coming out weekly, consistently. Yeah. Uh, I am sure that that was not the original plan, but I am here for them coming out at this pace. Oh, yeah. I Yeah, I... I, I we've talked before. It's been a while, I think, but we've talked before about how if you're going to do a big crossover thing like this, you need to push through it as quickly as possible. Mike, you need to do it weekly and get through one it. One of one of the things that that I think helps show a little more clearly, but which I I think is a a strong feature of this event in the first place is how many how many different views there are on how to approach a complex problem and the fact that there's not a clearly delineated pair of sides saying okay it's this or that like you have yeah. you have some some people like cap who they are a soldier so they get in and they help repel the invasion you have t'challa saying okay what is the strategic plan what do we need to defend right and like well, identifying and, and, the the yeah. military targets, you've right. got now Mantis saying, you know, maybe there is a diplomatic answer. You have Reed and and Tony, to maybe a lesser degree, looking for a technological solution. You have Carol helping deal with big picture cosmic incidents uh, uh, or, or or battlefronts, sorry. right? Like yeah, yeah, right. off in yeah. other places. We know Thor's looking for something magic in space, uh, mm -hmm. which sounds reductive, but that's really, we get a panel of, here's right. where Thor that's, is. Yeah. Um, like, everyone kind of is working the leads they can work, and it doesn't become, it doesn't become what it was kind of teased as, as like two sides fighting. Instead, it's everyone is sort of playing to their strengths, and everyone has different angles that will probably all need to be necessary to be worked, and it's never a, right. no, I'm right. right well, there's, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to find that any of these are the solution, right? Yeah. What we're going to find is, you know, yeah, the fact that we were able to, you know, Cap is able to lead these people to repel attacks in these locations, and, you know, uh, T'Challa is able to apply military pressure here, you know, allows the technology solution to, you know, infiltrate and gain some information that, you know, I don't know. I'm just, you know, yeah. but my point is all of these contribute to what eventually becomes, you know, the, the, the resolution of this, Yeah. you know, much like, Oh, how would you approach a complex problem? Yeah. Not in a single way. You have to, you know, you have to approach it wherever you can. And, yeah, maybe if there's a, yeah. a major global threat, you form coalitions and alliances and pool resources and talent in order to work it from every viable angle to solve the problem quickly and not isolate yourself from everyone else insisting, no, I am right, and refuse any sort of global mm -hmm. uh, initiative to actually stop the spread of this thing. Wow, that, that sounds almost like a well-thought-through intelligent response. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I didn't know that... <laughs> 
that just, just came into to your me head. from the ether. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why I would read that that way. Empire Who Avengers <laughs> is the next the next step in the journey. Hmm. Um, this is oh, this is the Pietro issue. That's what this one was. Right. Anytime, right, right. anytime I can see Quicksilver just eat shit, I'm happy with it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, I I think that's all I need to say about that one. Do you have anything else? No, uh, not particularly. I it was this was this was an enjoyable one to watch. Yeah. Um, we're gonna go ahead and drop an X Men ten here because I think. Oh my god! Well, this is God a trio of obscure x-men characters to me uh this is i think more empire than x-men yes this week agree. uh we are on the moon at casa de summers and they live a mile from the blue area and what's going on in the blue area right now oh big kotati invasion yeah so yeah. um the third summer's brother that's who that is right that's the third summer's brother yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vulcan, um, right? Vulcan, yeah. Vulcan takes a walk and blows up the Kotati, or at least one of their encampments. While uh, it's a, it's a, it's like a, uh, a military huge cannon that's actually firing on positions. On yeah, Earth. it's actually going to fire on Krakoa, is what it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, it's day drinking time on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> My two new favorite mutants. Uh, Sway and Petra? Yes. I know yes. nothing about them except they're my favorites now. You want to go, go after find him? him? My head says yes, but this drink says no. So maybe in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a big, like, mushroom cloud explosion in the distance. Yeah, yeah. There's another another round. Oh, uh, yeah, what is it? Uh, uh, oh, hello, Emperor. <laughs> after they see the mushroom cloud. What about now? Now my head says, hell no. And my drink says, I'm delicious, please finish me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, moving uh, on to Captain Marvel. This is probably one we do want to spend a little more time on. Um, yeah. So This had uh, something I was not expecting in it. <laughs> I mean, in a very general sense, it calls back to the life of Captain Marvel, which I was yes. not expecting to happen right here. Nope. But it makes a lot of sense. As Carol puts it, when you're carrying around a Cree accuser's hammer, it's hard to ignore that you've recently found out that you are, in fact, half Cree and your mother yeah. was a Cree warrior. Yes. At, like one of the great Cree warriors, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she is sent to what was supposed to be a sort of test case for Cree and Skrull citizens Community. living together uh, yeah. in harmony. That has been destroyed, we are told, single-handedly by a single Kree warrior. Mm -hmm. um, and an entire military group cannot stop her, so they send in Carol as an accuser to right. accuse her and stop her and bring her in. Yes. Or, and... well, really presumably kill her. I'm pretty sure accuser really means, you know... Off with a her accuser head. is judge, jury, executioner. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, like, yeah, that, literally, this this warrior has single handedly held off, uh, you know, this entire squad. So Carol's like, okay, fine, I'll go in, and she goes in, and you know, she calls to her, and the soldier literally comes out and surrenders. Yeah. Like, lays down arms, says, "Okay, I will surrender to you." Yeah. And uh, Carol uses the hammer to, like, read her memories and realizes, oh, she is also a clone and is also half-human. And her mother is also Muriel. Yeah. Why? Wait. What? <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is so Carol's half-sister and now they're on the lab. <laughs> this is Carol's half-sister? Yeah. Um, who is a combination of, uh, I don't know if it says who the father is. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Oh. No, just made from the DNA of two great Kree skull soldiers, one oh, of which is Kree. her mother. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so she is full Kree. She is full right? Kree. Yeah, but uh, yeah, her mom is also Carol's mom. So yeah, they're half sisters, and uh, 
she's like, do you have any, you know, I'm, but I'm here to accuse you. And she's like, I understand. And, you know, I, I will submit to your judgment. And she's like, do you have anything to say? And she's like, well, I'm innocent. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> also, you know, she was not going to tell Carol about her relation to her. Correct. Because she didn't want that to weigh on Carol any more than killing her already would. And it's like, this character, okay, this character is maybe too good. I am worried either for her survival or that it won't be a yeah. trap. But I hope she's actually this good. So have you seen the new she rock cartoon? Two all? episodes. I just okay. started watching. Okay. There's a character in there whose name is Scorpia who very much reminds me, like even just kind of the look on her face here reminds me of that character for some reason. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that in mind when you, uh, when you get to that part. I will. I, yeah, I need Carol to have a good sister in space. That would make me so happy. Like Carol having any family she can trust seems like yeah. it would do her so much good. Yes. I 100% agree. I th and I think there's a uh, one of the things I'll be honest that this whole empire thing probably what I'm most excited about is actually not the event itself. I mean, it's been really good so far, I think. Yeah. But it's the potential for what kind of new stories they can tell and what the new game board can be coming out of it after. I just remembered the cover art for the last Captain Marvel Empire tie-in, and now I'm sad. Oh. Well, the good news is nobody stays dead. <laughs> I, I just true. assumed that's what you meant. <laughs> it's true. You know, yeah. You know, uh, it, it is comics, so and nobody stays dead. <laughs> unless Peter Parker loves them. Empire Captain Parker America is, number one. Well, yeah, okay. Uh... This is this is the capside story where he basically says tells the general who's like, no, we have to have all of our services here to protect just us. And Cap's like, pretty much like, uh, well, fuck off because this is somebody trying to annihilate the entire human race. So we're gonna act like you know we're all one kind of people and do what needs to be done to defend everybody. So that thing I said a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Very Cap, Cap. Cap puts together a, is it a new Howling Commandos? <laughs> Maybe. That would make it sense. Would not it would not surprise. Like one of the characters kind of jokes, is jokingly says, oh, so are we the new Howling Commando? And I, like, I, I'm wondering if that's going to actually be a thing. <laughs> I mean, I hope so, since Dum Dum Dugan is a Dum Dum uh, holding up the outlawed law. Yeah, yeah. So, Earning that anyway. nickname. Yeah, yeah, but so yeah, Cap's gonna take a uh, take a group, uh, take a contingent, and go help. I think it's like Mexico City and South America defend themselves. Cool. Yeah, and that brings us to Empire X Men, which you know what? If there is a book that is the most logical group of characters to call in to fight the Kuktati. This is it, and also I never, ever, ever would have guessed that they were bringing these characters in. I yeah, you you could have said you know who are they bringing? You probably even could have said who from you know Hickman's involvement in the X Men could they bring in? And I would not have picked these characters. I don't think. Yeah. Um. But before that, we get yeah. set up part one. Uh, Scarlet Witch. And attempting to atone for the whole House of M, No More Mutants uh, thing. Goes back to Genosha and raises everyone who died there as zombies. Oops. Like, like I, I'm going to have to start calling her Tony or Steven if she keeps doing things like this. I am I was going to say Barry Allen. Uh, yeah, that would fit too. I think Wanda like, Maximoff like, is the Barry Allen of the Marvel Universe. Like, uh, good intentions, but... Damn, really? Like when 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 Doctor Strange tells you, "Yeah, you just can't do this. You're gonna have to live with it." And you do it anyway? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. So what's more terrifying than a horde of zombies? Well, we have zombies and then the Kotati invade, which means and this is I enter this as best white page of a Hickman era X-Men book. Yes. In the biggest, well, boldest letters. Hold on. Wait, wait. 
I will say the best white page so far to the point that it is presented. It is the well, best white page ever. This one made me laugh more, but only because the second one builds on this one. Correct. That's fair. We'll, so we'll submit them as a pair. Okay. That um, is that is the best way to do this, yes. Yeah. 100%. Um, we get the title card. What is essentially a title card for the issue. Yeah. Describing this fight, Plants vs. Zombies. But is it just Plants vs. Zombies? Well, Because they're been... not regular zombies. <laughs> I can't remember. What's the description of the plant? Oh, I, I do know what it is. It's mutant zombies versus alien plants. <laughs> Sure, it's plants versus zombies, but um, yes. <laughs> but the the specifically because it also there's a game called Smash Up, which is a, a tabletop game where essentially you get two like random factions, and uh -huh. there's you know like there's like zombies and ninjas and pirates yeah. and aliens, and, right? And essentially you get two of them and they get smashed to get so you have like mutant pirates or you know zombie ninjas or whatever. It specifically kind of reminded me of that, you know, That's mutant zombies of, and alien the plants. iPhone game, Plants vs. Zombies. No, sure, yeah, and yeah. there was definitely that, yes, yeah. 100%, yeah. Um. Anyway, then side three shows up. <laughs> <laughs> and it becomes Remember Plants vs. Saying... Zombies versus Old Ladies. <laughs> That's right, it's horticulture. It's horticulture, yes. I love them so much. They're the best, and I did not know they were the heroes we needed, but they are. <laughs> the old ladies I, I, are going to show the X Men how it's done. They all. I, I. I can't describe how much I love this. I cannot describe, and yet it's still probably only my second favorite X book this week. <laughs> Well, we will get to your, your favorite. I know, shortly. I know. Uh, for now, speaking of nobody staying dead, let's talk about Amazing Spider-Man, Sins Rising. Yeah. We had the so, Prelude was... and uh, Part 1 in Amazing Spider-Man number 45. So Prelude is, it, it, I, I, they build this one and marketed this and solicited this correctly. Yes. Prelude is exactly what it says. It is... It is the historical recap of this character so that you know who he is, which was absolutely perfect for me because I had no clue who this person was. Same. And I feel like this is the perfect way to do something like that where you are I agree. using a framing device that really, I think, carries most of what's going on and moves that character forward, but then also slipping in pages from the original stories as like flashbacks yeah and it allows someone like you and i who did not know this character at all to pick this up and get all of the story that we needed right whereas if you are somebody who has read all the spider-man you know this character's story etc cetera, etc cetera, you having to read that again in the main book yeah it's probably not in the main story it's probably not what you wanted but see, I think even if you know that character, there's probably still value in the prelude for, if nothing else, sort of seeing the the hell that this character is living out, that the Sin Eater uh, is, the uh, literal hell that the Sin Eater is in. I don't disagree with you. My point being, I don't think seeing it in the main story is where you want it. Right, right, right. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure it's where I would put it either. Like, I think this is absolutely the right call. I, yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, like, then I we like move on at. to the 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 first part of of Sins Rising in Amazing Spider-Man number forty five. Yeah, which, which is Overdrive. Where did do you remember where the was it maybe Amazing Spider-Man number forty four? That would make sense. Where we got the dream Peter has about Overdrive. I think it in? was yeah. Okay, I think it was forty. Yeah. Um, I was not, and I don't know why, because everything we know about Kindred really lends itself to this i was not expecting this to feel as much like a horror story as it does it really does doesn't it like it's it it's got and when we say a horror story it's almost a like a think ghost story yeah like more than like a, not like a slasher film or not a uh, right the thing it reminded me the most of, and I will say I am not a big horror person. I don't watch a lot of it. 
Um, Mostly because I'm an easily startled child who does not care for jump scares because I get tired of having to scrape myself off the ceiling. Um, It follows. Like this chapter in particular where we see, maybe a little bit of 44 bleeds into this, but where we see Overdrive has constantly been driving trying to escape the Sin Eater who's like always in his rearview mirror. Yeah. Um, And like that... That makes me think of that, like, pretty one-to-one. That's the premise, right? Like, you keep moving or the thing catches you. Yeah. Uh, only, you know, in this case, Overdrive's not trying to hook up with some unsuspecting person and pass a curse on. Um, but then the moment that really, really locks this in is horrifying to me is when Spidey tries to jump in front of the bullet Sin Eater shoots at yep. Overdrive. Mm-hmm. And it passes through Spider-Man leaving him totally unfazed, but still hits and kills Overdrive. Yep. And there's something about that, especially for Spider-Man, like, what's the most terrifying thing to Spider-Man? A bullet that you can't jump in front of. Like, that's so perfect for him. Yeah, like, it doesn't matter if you're willing to sacrifice yourself, you still can't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. And... Oh, we have, by the way, and then after that, Sin Eater just disappears. And I don't mean like, you know, like Batman, like, you know, I mean like literally just there's a little cloud of smoke and he's gone. Yeah. Like yeah, Batman. It, it, like, like, well, <laughs> but like Batman, you know, just leaves. Like, no, yeah. this dude just straight up just fucking uh, disapparates in front of you. Yes. Okay. Like Nightcrawler. Yes. There you go. He bamps. With no bamping. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also like, need... like a ghost just blinking out. Yeah. <laughs> I also need to acknowledge the return of one of my favorite characters from the Dan Slot run, Carly there you, Cooper. I'll, there you go. I was I was waiting for that comment. Yeah. I love Carly Cooper. I don't know why I like Carly Cooper as much as I do, but I love Carly Cooper. I'm glad to see her back. I'm glad to see she's yeah. doing well after the whole uh, started to say Joker toxin thing, uh, Goblin toxin thing. Yeah. Well, and she is now the medical examiner, right? Yep. And she it starts out with her, you know, getting ready to, to do an autopsy on a body. And at the end, we see that the autopsy she's going to do, isn't that Overdrive? That's Overdrive, who, like, yeah, the wound has healed and he is alive again, which... Yeah, the, wo- the wound's gone and he wakes back up, huh? Back to horror story vibes. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, there's very much a a a creep creep feel to this. Yeah. Yeah. Like ugh, like a heebie jeebie feel. Yeah. Uh Daredevil number twenty one. The beginning of the new arc. Uh which sees Daredevil turning him over turning himself over for the murder he committed at the beginning of the Starsky run. Yeah. What did you think about this? Man, I you know what? I this which I think is perfect and I think it's probably exactly what was intended. I got a lot of complex feelings about this. Yeah? Yeah. Um so like I love the conversation he has with Spider-Man because it's a very real reaction, right? Right. Spider-Man has told him if you put the devil costume back on, I'm coming back for you, right? Yeah. And and Matt does to finish up, you know, protecting and and doing all this. But he specifically he does it kind of to prep himself for turning himself in, right? Right. And he's like he's like first of all, and yet at the same time, at the same time that Daredevil is acknowledging, yes, I understand, I can't, you know, keep being the Daredevil after what I did, right? And acknowledging this. He's also essentially telling Spider-Man, oh, by the way, and fuck you, you don't get to judge me. Yeah, which, that beat reads really well alongside Sins Rising. Right? Because you get that moment in the Sins Rising stuff that goes back to Daredevil stopping Peter from killing the Sin Eater. Yeah. Which is not anything I was ever aware of and would not have known about without that book coming out right now. Yeah, like, it's a wonderful little, uh mirror there isn't it yeah um yeah so yeah matt murdoch turns himself in and foggy uh, being the brilliant friend and that he is 
um, basically uh, manages to work out a deal with the DA that uh, turns out the Supreme Court in the Marvel Universe, in the 616 Universe, has ruled that superheroes can testify in court against, you know, villains or people that they can't yeah. capture, whatever, whatever. And because of that, because they can testify as the superhero in costume, that superheroes have a legal identity that exists. Yes. And therefore, the person that has to be charged with murder is not whoever is under the mask, but it is Daredevil himself. And therefore, right. he can be arrested, he can be booked and prosecuted as Daredevil in his mask. I love this so much. I love this for two reasons. One, it is the exact argument I make every time this, oh, we need to bring you in and unmask you bullshit that yeah. never plays out comes up. Right. Correct. Uh, like It is always the thing that in my head I'm like, no, this is the answer. This is why you don't have to do that. This is case law in the Marvel Universe. Where are my attorneys at? Um, yeah. 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 Like, it's a very thought out legal response right like yeah. i mean i'm certainly not a lawyer and i'm sure there are a lot of other legal ramifications that would have to be part of this but like it but like from a legal setup and base thing it makes sense right yeah. i mean the reality is and maybe this maybe this is where the story goes to is some sort of civil rights group or even maybe a less well-intended organization, probably a less well-intended organization, would would sue at some point saying, no, we have to disclose this person's identity. That would have to go through court and appeals and eventually itself wind up at the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court would have to uphold the judge's idea. Sure. You know, a judge's ruling, the DA's idea that, okay, yes, we can try him. That would all happen. But sure. there's... Foggy is right when he says there's case law that supports this. I'm like, that's the thing that matters here. Right. Um, yep. The other thing I love about it is, great, okay, we don't even need to go through all that if that's not what Starsky wants to focus on. Because this lets us tell new stories without having to go through all the brouhaha. Of, yep. Perhaps we'll unmask you. Right. Yes. Like, like not just this story, but like, Lots of potential stories in the future, right? Right. Yeah. I'm like also you can have you can ha you can have a legal case now that you know involves superheroes that doesn't involve any kind of threat of unmasking, right? Yeah. It can just be about the other part of it. Yeah. The Hulk is sued for his unpaid parking tickets. <laughs> oh man. Let's be honest. That would be She Hulk. I've read Dan Slott's run. The Hulk just jumps from place to place. There you go. Uh, anything else on this? Um. Oh, the 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 one other thing that does happen here is the DA says, "Look, the right. one way I'm going to allow this is if you unmask for me and me alone." Right. And well, I'm not going to reveal who you are. I'm not, but I have to know who I'm. I have to know who it is that I'm prosecuting. And I love that exchange between the DA and Matt. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah. pissed. He's pissed that it's Matt. I mean, the first thing he does is backhand him, which is... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, and so, I'll, I'll give my prediction for this. Um, And this this first part of it isn't a stretch. Well, I guess, if you know Daredevil, neither part of this is a stretch. And that is that, that Daredevil will be found innocent. I don't know if we'll get more about the story or whatever, but I think Daredevil will be found innocent. But Matt will have trouble accepting that judgment. Or we get to see Daredevil in prison. There's also that. <laughs> that could also be... This is a win-win-win. I, like, I don't yeah. see a bad way out of this. <laughs> you know, for me, Daredevil, it's yeah. all going to be bad. But... <laughs> As the reader, no. Well, I mean, that's right, being yeah. Daredevil. Right, hey, that's kind of what I'm... Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, you're, if you're writing Daredevil right, there's no way he wins at the end of the day. That's not no. true. There are some good Daredevil runs that try to do it. There right. are. Mark but, Wade. Yeah. But not but it, it, is it Daredevil without suffering? I mean, yeah. no, probably not. Not yeah. in modern comics. It's like is it, is it Tony Stark without arrogance? I mean, you know, let's, let's be real. Is it Cap without a fantastic ass? 
Moving on. Speaking of fantastic asses, X Men time. Oh, here we go. Uh, once again, I've actually got these in reading order. Okay. So I will start off. Uh, start us off with X Men Fantastic Four number four. Um, this is the end of this mini series. I don't think the way I'm not going to spoil every everything that happens here at the end of it. I don't think the general way it wraps up is going to come as much of a shock. Uh, the X Men and Fantastic Four end up uniting to fight Doom and his Sentinels. Uh, and to rescue the mutants who he had trapped in Doombot armor and was controlling. Uh, what I think is surprising at the end of this and will have ramifications down the road is how Xavier and Magneto react to Reed's having made the technology that could hide Franklin's mutant genes in the first place. No. Um, it also seems like Doom may still be up to something. Valeria calls him out for being shady. Uh, Valeria is the best. Valeria is, especially when it comes to Doom. The Doom Valeria relationship will always be one of my favorite things because this just—I mean, originally like two, three-year-old child and now teenager who can call out Victor Von Doom and get away with it. Mm-hmm. It's it's just the best thing. Um, so that is that. Like the the one thing I truly truly regret that we did not get in, when Doom was his reformed self was a mini series where Doom was playing mentor to Valeria and Nadia. <laughs> yeah. 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 I I need Valeria and Nadia to meet still. Right, yeah, and be like best friends forever, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that can that can be something to look forward to in the future. There we go. New Mutants number eleven. Uh, this is presumably the end of this Russia Nightmare Sphere arc. It's not yeah. Russia; it's Carnalia. Yeah, former Russian satellite. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and they managed to, uh talk down, you know, uh, help this mutant who couldn't control her abilities. Uh, yep. They managed to get her to Krakoa and find her some help. Yep. Um, and wonderful. magic magic in this intervenes yet again to clean up a mess that Cyclops has told her to stop making. So I am sure we are continuing to build toward uh, some sort of conflict in this between Scott and Liana. The other thing is we get a very clear message that a something that's coming up is there's this essentially a mutant doxing site. Yeah. That exists. That is out. That's how they knew about, uh, you know, the, what was going on in, in, was it Nebraska, I think? Yeah. Um, and, you know, who, about this girl in Russia, and they're continuously outing mutants. Yep. And... One of one of the things that this batch of X-Men books we're going to be talking about today has uh-huh. me wondering is whether Cyclops is going to make it through Ten of Swords. Because there's a lot of Cyclops in this that feels like like it's dealing with very specific relationships in ways that seem like they might be leading to some kind of closure. And maybe that's just part of a bigger design for things. Maybe. But, like, we see him in this... We, we, we get sort of the hints at the the tension with magic in this. We see him in Cable trying to track down young Nathan. We see him... We saw him in X-Men 10, like, just taking family vacations and mm-hmm. writing to his brother... I don't know. It feels it feels like something is coming either way for Cyclops. Yeah. Um. I I wonder. Either some sort of change of some major change of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Wolverine number three. Okay. Wolverine borrows a hat. He does. Yeah. And uh. 
challenges so did he challenge him to a drinking contest is that what it was i think they were just out drinking together were they just out drinking together maybe drunk i I love you man magneto is my new favorite magneto (laughs) what what i'm seeing this week is i need mutants to drink more i'm glad they've opened this tiki bar (laughs) and i love that blob runs it (laughs) yes yes it's beautiful um yeah so turns out magneto can't hold liquor as well as wolverine can wow no. is that a shot to anybody <laughs> to i mean the anybody? only the only people who can hold wol- liquor as well as wolverine are his kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's probably we've fair. already seen their drinking games <laughs> <laughs> yes this is true um so yeah so um he borrows magneto's helmet <laughs> yeah because people aren't getting in his head again nope and then comes what i what i must absolutely point out so um he needs a telepath so he decides to recruit quentin and how does he do that alex by promising to get quentin a date with the cuckoos <laughs> and so the cuckoos are all hanging around quentin saying oh you're gonna fight this person that's so brave that's so amazing to the and that meanwhile they're t- they're tell it they're telepathically talking to logan saying all right we're doing this for you but you got to get us what we really want cable <laughs> i look forward to the issue of cable that is cable versus quentin <laughs> I cannot wait to see that play out. And I had to specifically point that out because of what's coming up soon. Yeah. Um, The other thing we learn in Wolverine is that Russia has gone totally dark on Cerebro and there might be a Russian alternative to Krakoa being made. Yeah, like a artificial Krakoa. Yeah. Yeah. Hellions number two. Um, Uh, This is the team that it took me a minute to piece back together what had happened last, because this is the first issue of this we've had yeah. since March. Right. Um, this is the team that's been sent to the school where Scott and Alex Summers were raised, the orphanage where they were raised, which was run by Mr. Sinister to wipe out his cloning lab. And when they get there, they find the original Marauders in what i will call a state of severe disrepair yeah um and madeline pryor who (sighs) is pulling some strings and has the line when did you get back a while ago nobody cared (laughs) which feels both like reasonable motivation for her being angry and also some really hilarious form of editorializing yes yes like like oh shit she's right (laughs) Like, to Pretty the point much. where I wonder if there was someone in the X office who was like, how are we going to bring her back to life? And then they realized, oh, wait, that she she's alive. She's been back for a while. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, oh, shit. <laughs> to, which, to, to which it was just an immediate, hey, you know what? Maybe that's why she's pissed. <laughs> yeah. Nobody remembered she was alive. That feels like that kind of thing that comes from a planning meeting. <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, and specifically for her, it's the perfect motivation, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is the character who was who was literally a you know, a, a clone of Jean. Yeah. Who Scott pretty much threw away when Jean came back. Yeah. Cause Scott Summers yeah. is trash, never let it be forgotten. Correct. Um yeah. things do not go well. Everyone basically gets their asses handed to them. Yeah. This is like, uh, you know what, it, it, this is like the Marvel X, you know, mutant version of Suicide Squad. Yeah. yeah. I think it's exactly that. Yes. Yeah. I think I think DC, you know, put the Terrifics out, which was their version of Fantastic Four, and Marvel was like, you know what? Okay, we can kind of do that. And they put out a mutant version of Suicide Squad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I I joke about DC making Spider-Verse, but that's just the Batman family. Um <laughs> X Factor number 1. I saw a a headline on Twitter for oh a review and I did not read the review because I had not read the issue yet and I already had it sitting here on my desk. 
but it referred to this i think it was polygon.com referred to this as the horniest x-men book yet uh which one is a pretty high bar given any book with scott gene and logan in it yeah right but two i don't know why i was surprised when dawkins showed up after reading that no no not at all well and specifically like i don't know i think this has to be my quote of the week <laughs> brian's quote of the week quote quote uh yeah so like north star and polaris are and we'll get into like the motivation behind this in a minute but essentially they're getting ready to go off and try to find out what happened to uh his sister to aurora and um they put out a call that if there's any mutants that are willing to help, you know, we're getting ready to leave, you should come to the gate and show up with us. And Dokken shows up and John is like, no, not you. Go away. What is it? Norse, are you too good to work with the reformed rabble? Because my supervillain days were a long time ago. No, that's not it. It's not that I don't uh, enjoy messes. Uh, you are 12 kinds of messy, Dokken. You're such a potent concentration of disaster bisexual that I fear your chaos is contagious. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is such a wonderful description of Dokken as well. And then you get you get this mother chasing her kid, right? And normally, you know, and the kid's like, no, this, that, and the other kid's kind of acting up a little bit, right? And he's like, no, I, don't I hate go grandma. See grandma. I don't like her, blah, blah, this, that, and the other. He's like, no, you don't mean that you hate her, sweetie. Da, da. And then what would normally be, right, the, oh, what a cute kid, you know, this, that, and the other, et cetera, et cetera. No, we get Rachel turning and going, no, you don't mean that, sweetie. Yes, he does. Huh? You know you're raising a psychopath, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's like, damn! <laughs> Rachel, why would you say that? He was thinking really loudly about kicking my dog. Yes. Which, by the way, who is the dog? It's the, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, but they found them in Excalibur and gave Rachel War the last baby. It is the puppy Warwolf. Yes, Warwolf. Whose name is Amazing Baby. And, like... If we don't have an amazing baby, Jeff the Jeff the Shark, I don't know who else needs to be involved. Uh, oh, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Jonathan, we don't who have... is still unaccounted for in Donna right. Um, If we do not have some sort of, like, mutant... Mutant pet Avengers. Pet, pet Avengers. Like, what the hell are you doing wrong, Marvel? Come on. Look at these people. <laughs> look at these I animals. Am... I am pleased to say that Deadpool number six, I believe it is. Six, nine, the October issue. Uh, yeah. I think the October issue. An upcoming issue of Deadpool has Deadpool going to Krakoa with Jeff in tow. Oh, so it is possible. for that. There is, um, there is art of Emma Frost petting Jeff. So oh, let's, we're going to step back for a minute. The setup of this is... Um, uh, North Star is, you know, kind of in his apartment or whatever and, on Krakoa, and we just see him drop his coffee cup because he knows Aurora has just died. Yes. I mean, they're twins. We know from lots of history that they have connections to each other, and essentially, like, he knows that she's dead. Yeah. He goes to talk to the five and basically cuts in line and says, you gotta resurrect her. And they're like, whoa, 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 okay. First of all, this is not how this works. Yeah, all stop these being other people an asshole. Here, right. I mean, that, that's kind of like telling Wolverine to stop being, you know, moody. Smelly? That's, oh. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no. But <laughs> stop telling, you know, Batman to brood. That's not going to happen. But <laughs> It's true. Um, but, Actually, in every yes. sense of the word, both in terms of glowering and in terms of <laughs> building a family. Right, yeah. <laughs> beautiful beautiful um so essentially they're like okay first of all uh, we understand but all these people you have to first of all how do you know she's dead he's like and just know it's my sister and a no they're like yeah that's that's not gonna work for us yeah <laughs> you gotta have proof right 
So this starts. This basically sets off a chain reaction where Northstar goes and talks to Sage, and she's like, "Well, this is where she, when she last used a gate and where she went, but I don't know what happened after that." So he goes to the bar to where she was last seen on Krakoa uh, to talk to Blob, uh, and Lorna is in there, and uh, Lorna's like, um, uh, "You know, I, I overheard you. Why don't we go find out what happens?" Essentially, right? And she's like, maybe we could set up like a little group to go find out. And this is the first time Doc and get volunteers. He wakes up off of the floor of the bar <laughs> <laughs> and volunteers. And they're like, no. <laughs> I just said I'm available. Cowards, you should have just said no, because they go flying <laughs> off. <laughs> um, but what we essentially get after, after several things are we get a group who ha- they have put together to go find out what happened to Aurora. Yeah. And it is uh it is Northstar, it is Lorna Dane, it's Dokken, it is Prodigy, uh Rachel Summers. Iboy. Is it Iboy or I Guy? I always want to call him I Guy. I'm pretty sure it's I Boy. <laughs> it, I think it is I Boy, but I always want to call him I Guy. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh I prefer his so, Android counterpoint counterpart iRobot. iRobot, yeah. Um so, yeah, they all go to this location in Canada to find out what happened. And they each use their different skills in different ways, which is all wonderful. Um, you know, Dokken goes and uses his pheromones on the um, on the motel clerk <laughs> to get him to reveal <laughs> what he knows. Yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, and essentially, they track down that somebody lured Aurora into... Uh, driving a car that had been sabotaged and so it goes off into the water and she drowns and they recover her body um and take it back and he presents it to the five and he's like you know here's your proof right and they're like okay uh you know we'll we'll get we'll put her in the queue and we'll get started on her but essentially what comes out of all this is they realize that there is a ridiculously large number of these types of cases where people's loved ones have gone missing, and but yeah. they don't have any proof of what's happened. Yeah, like there's, I love, I love kind of the hook early in this that builds this idea where we see Jean Paul go to Sage because, I mean, she even says, "Look, first like, you're here now. Beast comes here asking me these questions. Other people, I like." She names two or three people who've all come like right. expecting her to tell them where people are right like i like the idea that this is coming out of this this thing that's been seeded for months now mm-hmm. uh of sage is this go-to but this is not her job clearly there's a need here that exists even beyond right. just what we see in this issue and so what com- what comes out of this is the quiet council approves the formation of x factor which is going to be an investigative team that, if certain uh, kind of triggers are put in place, if certain things are triggered, then they will get they will start an investigative case to find out what has happened to mutants. Right. Um, so, like, if uh, you know mutants have, if Cerebro can't make a backup of a mutant in a, in a month's time, because they've dropped, you know, basically they're invisible or they've gone off of Cerebro. Um, if, um, you know, uh, th- something like if, if they haven't used a gate or Sage can't find them uh, after, you know, it basically Cerebro triggers something and then it goes to Sage. And if Sage is like, yeah, I can't find them. I don't know where they're at. Then, you know, a case gets in, created for X-Factor to investigate. Yeah. Cable also sets up uh, fleet seeds. Yes. Which are seeds of Krakoa that you can whisper into and they will notify yeah. uh Forge, X-Factor. by the way. Sorry, what did I say? You said cable. Oh. Yeah, Forge. Um Forge. And so yeah. And Lorna goes and then I love she literally like has a conversation with Krakoa. Yeah. And talks about how you know rich it is in minerals and how she can literally because of her powers, she can feel the the soil and the ground and you know she can feel Krakoa, um and so she talks about she's like she's like let's cooperate and make something, 
Yeah. So you very much get the sense that it is her and Krakoa working together to create this new building that will be the headquarters for X Factor. Yeah. And um, Dokken names it. Do you remember what he calls it? I should, because I read it this morning. The Boneyard. <laughs> That's right. Which has a couple of wonderful implications to it. Yeah. I mean, first of all, they're investigating the people that are, you know, kind of presumed dead at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's that. Um, it's kind of a bit of a giant phallic symbol. <laughs> that is the first thing he of notices course it about. Is. <laughs> of yeah. course it is. Yes. But yeah, it's um, it, it's pretty awesome, and so they all go in, and uh, Rachel immediately walks around, and then comes back and says, "All right, I got dibs on the basement," and he's like, "All right, what part of it? No, the whole basement <laughs> is mine." Yeah, I really dig this book. Um, one, it I... feels like a lot of the X Men books do right now. It feels yeah. like a completely different kind of storytelling than any of the other yep. X books. Um, but too, like I like this idea of something that is ostensibly like small and personal and focused and procedural against yeah. the backdrop of all of the rest of the X Men stuff that's going on. Um, just because I do think it it lets you tell more more granular stories that we don't see a lot of right now in X Men. I, f I figured out specifically reading this book what it is about Hickman's X Men stuff or X book mutant books yeah that really really has me fired up right now and it is the fact that the biggest problem always with well there's lots of them but one of the major problems always with the mutant books at Marvel has been how messy and uncohesive they are. Yeah, they are literal because there's so many of them, and they already they kind of got scattered, and it felt like somebody would just write something and be like, I don't know, let's figure out where this might plug into what's going on somewhere else. I don't know, and, and like it, so everything kind of got written in its own thing, and it was just you know whatever. Yeah, this is all, despite being discreet, like this story doesn't directly come out of something else, but like you said. But it plugs in 100% with consistency to everything else that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I I think what you're saying is true about X Men books in general. But I think I would take I would take it a step further and say that what what the X Men line right now is doing with with Hickman in the title that he's been published as recently as head of X. Uh, what it is pulling off is, I think, unique even outside of X Men, uh -huh. in just how much how much things are planned and integrated from book to book, how many little beats jump from title to title, mm -hmm. and feed new ideas, like the idea of continuity. Usually in comics, feels more like okay, well. This writer is writing this event, and everyone else needs to find a story to tell inside of the confines of that event that's going on right now. And you right. take this character, and you do that character, and you give us a one-shot that comes right after this story beat, but before that story. Whereas this feels organic. This feels like it is adapting, and new ideas that pop up, new ideas that pop up in the course of story development are either broken apart across different books, or they go back and they find, okay, we've introduced these ideas here. Let's let's take those ideas and use them to build this next book. Right. Um, well, that's what I and that's what I meant by plugging in, right? Yeah. Kind of like you talked about where we had this this these these setups that were going on with Sage about you know clearly this is something, and then we get this whole completely different framework for a book, which is this investigative service, right? Yeah. It, that is that that is one hundred percent justified by what's come before it. It one hundred percent fits in with you know the thematics and the continuity and the story that they've built up to this point, uh, and can then very easily you can see so many places where this could then right have a story in it that leads off into potentially a whole nother title somehow, yeah. right? Like, it like feels, there's so many things, yeah. It feels collaborative more than... There you go. That's the best word for purely it. purely editorially driven. 
Which yes. Yes. I think it's drawing a really black and white distinction that is not always true. Do not get me wrong. Correct. You, you get, but, yeah. like, again, kind of this whole Sage thing, I could see being in a in a planning meeting, someone saying, you know, we keep using the speed at the beginning of books about going to Sage for information, whereas an editorial response might be, or a more traditional response might be, we should stop doing it, it's getting repetitive. This almost feels like, okay, why do we keep doing that in our storytelling? What's missing from this world that we can it, fill in it, with? It, you're exactly right. It's almost more a, instead of looking at a uh, what's wrong and how do we fix it by not doing this or making us plug this thing in, right? It's a, okay, if we have this problem, why and how? what's a good way in story to fix it? Yeah. Right. The other thing that happens is it almost feels like I could very easily see, like you said, it being um, this whole book being a result of, well, how do we tell this story as opposed to we have to create an X Factor book. Let's create the X Factor book and then figure out how it plugs in. Right. And like we've seen to the during the publishing hiatus a lot more books have been added to the Ten of Swords event. Mm -hmm. I imagine because without being able to work so far ahead past it, there was a lot more conversation about, okay, well, what are some other things we can do? How can we fit it in? And I bet that that feels a lot more natural than it might otherwise if, if in a more traditional event, quote unquote, a publisher sat down and said, okay, well, let's add some tie-ins. Um, right. And we've also seen at the same time, like Children of is it Children of X, Children of the Atom. Remember that book Children that was solicited, Vita yep. Ayala? Um, yep. That was supposed to be out by now. That's been pushed back. Uh, the, the editor, Jordan White, the editor for the line, has said it's still coming out at some point. But that's been pushed uh, back I, now to after. Uh, I think it's starts. October. Yeah, I think October um, is when that starts. Maybe, yeah. Maybe September, yeah. Uh, it's not before October. It definitely wasn't in the September okay. sources. Okay. It might even be after October. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but regardless, I, I think, yeah, I, I am ridiculously excited for Ten of Swords for one reason, and that is given what we just had this conversation about, I really, really want to see how they do an event book in Hickman's Expo. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got this weird feeling that it doesn't look a whole lot different than what we've seen right. so far, but it changes. It becomes like an act change. That is my guess. Like everything lines up at the end of it and there's a status quo change. And then we've got a new starting point for the next cycle. The other thing that I can't help, but think as where all of this is, is how I, I'm really hoping how well all of the books that are, that that do support it line up yeah naturally in their storylines to support it right which is what is generally the biggest problem with with event tie-ins right is that it feels like oh okay we're we have the story that's going on in this book we just li- literally stop for two issues to do this tie-in piece and then we go back to what we were doing well right? and i think what's telling is while there are one shots each month that are, I assume, like, act breaks within the, the event story itself. There's no yeah. event title. It's all told across the line. Correct. Yep. Uh, anyway, I think I okay. think we can move on from there. Yeah, we can. Yeah, let's go on from X Factor. <sighs> yeah. Uh, that leaves Cable. It does. So, uh, Brian, why is it relevant that cable or that the cuckoos were promised to date with cable because in this issue of cable we see at least one of those dates and hear about a couple of others yep yeah so um and you know what you know who can probably sum this up best i think their mother emma could probably (laughs) sum this up best so emma goes storming in to see scott who Um, is eating a cheesesteak who's eating a cheesesteak scott do you know what Nathan, your young Nathan is up to? And Scott, in his head, replies, Hello, Emma. I can guess which one is he seeing. She speaks, All of them. 
Celeste couldn't wait to tell me. You don't think I'm actually going to let you speak to me with your mind while you sit there and eat that log of meat and bread, do you? <laughs> <laughs> because Scott is eating while he's having a conversation with her. <laughs> yes. Um, and then um, Scott says, wow, well, the six of them <laughs> are old enough to, and her response is got like I, I honestly I've got to have two quotes of the week because this is <laughs> Brian's quote of the week part two. <laughs> Emma says, "Frankly, I expect a certain amount of tackiness from some of my girls, but not all of them. And I expect your son to be a gentleman. Do not let him break their hearts, except Esme. She needs it, Scott. So help me, she needs it." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I was crying I was crying I forgot <sighs> how funny because again it's been months since we've had an issue of Cable I forgot how funny this book is oh my god I do not expect well, Cable to be funny you remember who's writing it I, though right I, I did once I started reading it again yeah Ah, uh, it's Duggan. I mean, of course. Now, that probably by itself, and, and, and the fact that, you know, it, all of the cuckoos are dating him, and we see, like, one of he takes one of them on a mission to help him, and he's like, yeah, yeah I know, I know that I did this for Celeste, but, and I've got you here helping me. I promise I'll make it up to you. We'll go on a different date later. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, you know, because you know what, exactly what it feels like when he talks about that and the different dates. It feels like a an episode of The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've I've never watched it, so I will take your I, word for it. I, I I I have only seen like two or three of them, but holy crap, that's exactly what this feels well, like. Now I need him to gradually eliminate them by passing out roses. <laughs> now, if all of that wasn't enough to make this my favorite book of the week, then we have what is the other reason, which is, you know how somehow I wasn't sure, but Wonder Woman was only my second favorite art book of the week? Yep. Yeah, it would be because Phil Noto is doing this, and this, I, 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 my jaw was on the floor. This is so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah, th there there is a picture of I think it's Esme who's, who's actually on the date with I can't remember right now. Uh, yeah, it is. It's Esme. Yeah, there is a picture where he looks down at her and she's like looking up at him. Her face is just it's just beautiful. I, I yeah, like the artwork in this is fantastic. Oh my god, it's so good. Yeah, this is it was a good it was a good week for X Men books. That's what it was. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Now, is it still good? <sighs> I am stealing myself. Okay, let's do it. Billionaire Island, Listen, you, you number it. three. We learn that sometimes hell is other people and there is no escape. Wind, number two. Turns out the king's a big old bigot. Who's surprised there? Action Comics, number 1023. Brian. Um... Lois and Jimmy find out what Red Cloud is up to, and um, Superboy pays some people a visit. Amethyst number four, Brian. Um, Amethyst finds out who her real friends, who who are her real friends, and gets a much better picture on what's going on when she visits Opal. Batman Beyond number forty five. The League of Assassins fights the Bat Red and the Bat Blue. Batman Superman number 10. Uh, uh oh, here comes the Ultra Humanite down for some monkey business. <clears throat> the Flash number 758. Uh, Barry figures to catch Reverse Flash. He'll have to think like Reverse Flash and may come to, uh,. Regret the irony of that strategy. Justice League Dark, number 24. Detective Chimp re-recruits Wonder Woman to pull the team back together as it starts to fracture, while Zatanna decides she's gonna go to the other side herself and try to save her father. Legion of Superheroes, number 7. After the Legion realizes they're bad at politics, they have a vote for a new leader. 
Chew number one, we talked about last week, but I'm reminding you to buy it so I can get more, goddammit. <clears throat> Nailbiter number three. Uh, the clown car killers decide that they want to meet Warren and probably come to regret that, too. Oh, oops. Iron Man 2025. Uh, Tony takes the fight to Arno in space and realizes, oh, wait, Arno was right about this giant space deity coming to consume man oh, and shit. machine. Spider-Man Noir number two. Spider and Huma make their way to... Uh, Germany, and uh, uh, continue fighting Nazis, I guess. There's really not a second half of that. They make their way to Germany. The end. Mm. Spider-Man Venom, Free Comic Book Day 2020. Uh, The Avengers do not take very well to the fact that Venom didn't tell them about meeting an elder space god who wants to come destroy Earth as soon as he did. Uh, And Spider-Man and Black Cat fight off the vulture uh and then finally horizon zero dark free comic book day issue uh i'm throwing this one in here because we're going to talk about number one next week and this one is really i think a bridge from where the game ends uh to where the new series starts following talana and why she decides to leave and go on her own adventure all right next week's books brian why don't yes, you tell sir. me about Strange Adventures number four? I mean, yeah, the, I just wanted to. We, we haven't mentioned a lot about the. I mean, we mention it when it we comes up, but uh, we talk about it Tom every King's, chance we get. But we haven't talked a lot about it. Well, I, I just mean like <laughs> we, we haven't talked about it in like like solicitations or upcoming yeah. or whatever. And I mean, this, again, this is just a fantastic. It's another Tom King twelve issue, right? If you're not reading this, you, you definitely should be. Um, and you know, next issue comes out. I I got I gotta have it. This is the this is the in the parking lot read book. Yeah, yeah. it's so good. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn does start in earnest. Uh, this week number one is out, and I will mention again. This is written by one of the writers of the game. So wait, wait, wait. Jim Varney is in this book. What you said? It started in earnest. Uh... <laughs> Normally Sorry. that's my joke. How did I not see that? I don't know. It's called I being hoisted know. by one's own petard. Pretty much. Uh, giant size X-Men Phantom X number one, Brian. Uh yeah, so these these kind of these one shot off books, these giant size have all been really good. Yep. Um they are exactly what they should be, which are their complete own self-contained stories. But like everything else in the in the Jeff Hickman X, they plug in really, really well. Also, so, the Jonathan Hickman X. I don't know who uh, yeah. Jeff Hickman is. Oh, d- d- is that what I said? <laughs> you did. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I'm glad it's yeah, not just that- me. <laughs> It's not. That's my. That's my. There you go. There's my karmic payback for your for the joke I just made on you. We're we're at the two hour mark. Neither of us makes sense anymore. <laughs> hey, I told you I was going to ramble today. I told you that up front. It's true. So, you did. I did. All right. Anyway, but yeah. So I, I want it. It's going to be good. Uh, and finally, the dreaming waking hours number one of twelve. This is G Willow Wilson and Nick Robles. Uh, telling a story set in the Sandman universe. My understanding is you don't have to be totally caught up on the dreaming to read it. I hope that's true, because I'm not, uh, and plan on picking this up. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a beautiful comic. I'm sure it will be gorgeous. All right. And next week, we will be talking about new books. I think it's probably safe to say at this point that we should be able to stay on new weekly books fairly consistently. Yeah. Um, yeah. We may throw in the occasional, you know, shorter segment on a trade here or there, something we want to talk about. Yeah. But, uh,. I think we're probably, uh, uh, to borrow the colloquial expression, God willing and the creek don't rise, we are probably back to normal, or as normal as we have ever been. Or, so. you know, as normal as either of us ever get, right? <laughs> that was the joke. Uh, so, new weekly comics for the foreseeable future. Uh, anything else you want to add, Brian? Uh, I'm 
thinking, and we, we haven't talked about this yet, so I'm kind of springing on. I think solicitations will probably be out for next week, too. Uh, yes, I would expect that for next week. I yeah. think that's a so, fair bet. So th- there's a there's a there's a fairly good chance we might try to slip solicitations in as well. Yeah. All right. And on that note, uh, we would like to thank Chase Parker for our intro voiceover. If you head over to panelologypodcast.com, you can listen to us. You can find a link to our YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe and click like on the appropriate parts of your screen on our YouTube channel. Uh, I probably could have found a weirder way to phrase that. Uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash panelology. If you want merch, that's bit.ly slash panelology merch, capital P, capital M. And if you want to send us questions or comments or whatever, uh, you can do that at bit.ly slash panelology mailbag. Again, capital P, capital M. I almost said I'm Brian. What is happening? I'm Alex. <laughs> this show needs to end. This show, we're done. I'm Brian. Go read comics. <laughs>